by sharing the presentation or oh, we share the screen. Okay. Are you able to see the screen? Either you can let me know by unmuting your ma your uh, microphone or via the chat. Okay, uh, Marija said you can see it, so that's good. Um, <clears throat> Maybe the best thing is I make a very quick revision of what we've done yesterday. And uh, we can take it from there. I think. Uh... <clears throat> The key thing we've done uh, yesterday is that uh, we've looked at the various steps in performing a systematic review. So we frame questions, step number one, research the literature and identify the relevant papers, that's step number two. Then we have a systematic strategy to extract data. And extraction of the data involves extracting data concerning study quality. And um, once we have the data extracted, we can think about whether we need to perform a meta analysis. And once we know about the need to perform a meta analysis uh, and have all the information in front of us, we can use that information to make sensible judgments about what's the value of the information. So these are the various steps of systematic review. We also looked at the various relationships between the clinical process and the knowledge requirements. So for the first part, we have etiological research, then we have diagnostic research, then we have prognostic or therapeutic research. And we said that each one of these can be assessed either by collecting data directly from patients in which we can call this primary research. And then this primary research can be put together into a systematic review. The data in this case comes from published papers. And for each type of research, whether primary or secondary, we can construct questions using this format where we Imagine what are our population's in interventions and exposures and outcomes. So today we will look at a bit more detail about therapeutic research in addition to systematic review. So then we went through a process of framing questions discovering how questions can be used to write titles, then how a search strategy can be constructed. So at this stage, I think we can just come back to our task for yesterday. So I'll put that up on our slide. And I'll also put in front of me, the chat format. So at this stage, I can take any questions that cover the topic from yesterday, as well as any 
and as as well as from anybody who wishes to discuss their question or experience with search or framing of the objective so uh why did my video disappear uh, it should come back again now so I, it's it's over to you we'll spend a little bit of time having a discussion and then we can proceed to the next phase of uh, our our of my presentation and uh the further steps in systematic review and a randomized trial today. Well, Did anybody make an attempt to write their objective based on their question? Uh, hello, Maya here. I did it, but I just need a minute because I'm still in my car. <laughs> I'll be done briefly. <laughs> okay, so let's go through your question first. Uh, is, is that um, who, who was speaking just now? Can I? Can you just identify yourself? I can't hear you. I cannot understand why that's the case. Okay, who, who was speaking just now? Ah, Masha. Please, can you? Uh, uh, can you um, can you explain your question one more time so the colleagues listening can follow where we are and then figure out how to write the objective statement? I can't hear you. Maria, just a minute. You are uh, your connection is bad. Okay. In in the meantime, perhaps somebody else would like. Okay. So, um, Rella has uh, has written her objective statement. I just increase the size of the chat. Can you see the chat as well? I guess I better put on my glasses so I can see what is written. Okay. So if we monitor well, investigate genes, two groups of participants, patients and healthy women, will it be co- Ah, this is your question. Well, what will be the outcome? What's the purpose of the monitoring? Mirala? Okay, it's easier to talk, not to write. <laughs> okay, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, well, I'm not sure because in your book, uh, um, in examples of cohort and case studies, Everything is about interventions, okay? And uh, I'm just uh, uh, looking for because you have um, uh, boy women like uh, premature with a premature ovarian in, uh, in uh, sufficient. Uh, so there are like ill women. We are looking um, uh, putting in, uh, them in that group of uh, 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 um, uh, participants. But I'm not sure because we are not uh, uh, gave, uh, giving them uh, no, uh, no interventions, okay? But uh, we are just monitoring, okay? Something that they have or not have, okay? So I'm not sure uh, if we uh, are going uh, from uh, outcomes to uh, to um, uh, because there is no exposure to uh, monitoring genes or in cohort study we divide first uh, those two groups of women and then 
uh, monitor uh, if the uh, outcome is present or absent. Okay, so let's um, let's see. What is the so when if you are monitoring people, then you are going forward in time. That is correct. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> So this automatically makes it a cohort study, right? Okay. <coughs> so this automatically makes it a cohort study. What is this? What is measurement at the starting point? Uh, I'm taking uh, uh, a picked uh, uh, the genes I uh, want to monitor. Okay, a uh, few of them, and then uh, uh, I want to see. Uh, uh, if uh, they have mutation, okay, if there is more mutations in a boy a group than in a group of healthy women. Okay, just wait a moment now. So you are thinking that over a period of time the genes will mutate? No, they're or mutated or not already. Right. So this is your exposure. Can you see that people with mutation or people without mutation are the two definition or two groups inside your cohort that you are following. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, okay. So in this case, your exposure is inside the body, not outside, for example, by smoking. Okay. Or outside by, for example, taking medication. Okay. Uh, exposure is internal to the body. And you can say that those who have mutation are exposed, those who don't have mutation are not exposed, right? Okay. And then what do you intend to measure when you follow them up? Uh, I, to, I intend to measure to see if there is mutation or not. Okay. Well, then in that case, you are not really following them up because the purpose of follow-up is to see if something changes over time. Ah, okay, so you think, okay, okay, I see it. So yours may be a cross-sectional study mm -hmm. where you have taken people with particular characteristics. Okay. One group of people have a particular diagnosis, you call them patients. Okay. Another group of people are healthy. Okay. They don't have this diagnosis and you simply want to hear the rate of of gene mutation in the two groups. Okay. Is am, am I right about that? Yes, yes, very right. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So, okay. okay. So this is not a case control study. This is not a cohort study. This is like a cross-sectional study. Mm -hmm. uh, where you measure at the same time in a in a defined group of people. What is their rate of gene mutation? Yes, the rate. Okay. Right. Okay. So thank you then, very much. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Jaka, you asked a question about whether you need an intervention for a cohort study. There is no. Hopefully, my explanation to Marie Mirella made clear that uh, that exposure does not need to be an intervention in the form of a medication or a surgery. Exposure can be many things, including changes internal to the body. Uh, um, and then, uh, <clears throat> answer, you have uh, a question. Participants are people with pulmonary hypertension, uh, with hyperuricemia, therapies for intervention or exposure is allopurinol. Comparison. Well, the comparison will need to be something like a different therapy or placebo or therapy or standard care. The outcome can be whether mean pulmonary artery pressure or endothelial dysfunction occurs more often or less often um, uh, with allopurinol or without allopurinol. Does that make sense? 
Answer. If you wish, you can also unmute your microphone. Okay, right. So what you wrote as comparison is in fact your outcome. Your comparison will be defined by something other than allopurinol. Right. Uh, Marisha, we now look at your uh, question. Participants are people with this condition you described there. And then intervention is bariatric surgery. Well, the comparison would need to be something without surgery, right? Marisha, can you address my point? Or are your patients all of those who have had bariatric surgery? Or are your participants or population, as you call it, all those who have had bariatric surgery? Are you still there, uh, Marisha? Ah, okay, so now you can see that what you described previously as intervention is in fact your participants. Then I presume your interventions or exposures are different genetic variants. So you could say you have various exposures as defined by genetic variants. And the outcome is change in prognosis over time as defined by liver biopsy, lipid markers, or change in body mass index. D does that make sense, uh, Marija? Okay, very good. I think I can now move on to the question by Massa. Comparison of tissue-based uh, versus combination of tissue liquid-based uh, biopsy. So participants are people with this lung cancer. So what are you trying to achieve here? You simply wish to describe the rate of mutation in people with different types of non-small cell lung cancer. Is that the idea, Masa? Okay. So in that case, yours is also like a cross-sectional study. You are not really following people up, or are you? You're not trying to figure out whether survival is different or not different amongst people with lung cancer, is correct? Okay, so you are simply going to describe the, so it's like a cross-sectional study. You will describe the mutation rate in various groups as defined by different definitions for exposure, respect to measurements concerning mutation. All right, we now um, is there is there a question that I've missed? Or have I covered all the questions put to me so far? I'm here now with a better connection, Maya here. Yeah, please go ahead, Maya. So uh, our, my question is does percutaneous closure of patent for Aminovale form a long-term, uh, more than 90% functional barrier. So the population are exactly 250 patients after the PFO closure due to an embolic event. And our intervention is that we follow them with contrast echocardiography. And we want to cut of bubbles that are passing from the right to left atrial uh, between the, the device that we put in and the follow-up uh, follow is from one to ten years 
And then I also wrote it down. Exposures are the people with the close PFO and all the people that haven't got the close one yet. And we are looking to, for embolic events after the closure because we know that before the closure there are TIAs and um, CVIs and so on. And the outcomes are that the people that had the closure has a, a functional barrier and there are the bubbles that are passing are five or less and that there was no embolic events after the procedure, so six uh, months. Uh, uh, one, one second, look. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yes. You're describing the problem extremely well, but I'm unsure whether you are using the terms interventions and ex and out exposures or outcomes correctly. Mm -hmm. So this is what I would like to discuss. Okay. And hopefully clarify. Yes. So you are saying when you follow people up, you are looking for embolic events. <laughs> Just a moment. My daughter is still there. No worries. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> Maya, is you still there? Have we lost Maya? Looks like. Okay, in that case, what we will do is we will come back to take Maya's. Uh, I'm back, I'm back, I'm back. Yeah, back. Fun. <laughs> so, yeah, the participants. Well, what well, yeah, first of all, let's start with outcomes. You called, you told mm -hmm. me that you will follow people up to see whether they get embolic events in the future. Yeah, clinical. And then um, with the echocardiography, we're going to count the bubbles and see if there's any passing. Okay, so just one second. Um, so if the bubbles pass, is that an embolic event? We're going to correlate that. If there's more than five bubbles and an embolic event. So what are you trying to establish that? You want to know whether the number of bubbles that pass... Uh, correlate with the future development of an embolic event that has a clinical manifestation. Yes. All right. Now, from what I can see, your uh, participants are people who will be subjected to this test. Mm -hmm. The echo. The echo test. What is this test? I don't know what this short form is. So, you mean the contrast echocardiography? Okay. So the we contrast echocardiography is your intervention, is that correct? Yes. And what is the comparison? The people that come to us with an embolic event and no closure of the patent for Amenovale. Well, how can this be comparison? You just described to me that this is the population. The population are people who don't have or, or who have patent for a manovale, right? Yes, but closed. One group is closed and one is still open. Okay. How do you determine who's closed, who's open? They, the people that have the patent for Amenovale and uh, the embolic event, they, they come to the doctor. If they just have the patent for Amenovale, they don't, they don't know. So we get the patients due to the embolic event. So the people who are ill are admitted to the hospital, right? Mm -hmm. And how would you identify the people who are not ill? We can't. How? It, we, we could if we took people from their homes and we were looking for the patent for amenovalis in asymptomatic people. So you mean you might advertise it on social media yeah, if I pick it up and I can volunteer? Yeah. And then why would I agree to get this contrast cardio, uh, contrast studies that you are talking about? Because it's harmless. <laughs> And it's good what, for what, what do you mean it is harmless? How how is this test done? Because this is a um, typical trans thoracic echo, not trans esophageal. It's uh, normal. You just put some 
uh, contrast in your in your vein, and then you. So see why would I agree? I am completely normal. Why would I agree to let you get inside my vein? So you can do something better for our world's population. <laughs> well, well I, I I wouldn't want to do it. Maybe someone else would. <laughs> Okay, so you can already see that a problem can develop. The people who volunteer mm -hmm. to be in the control group may be quite different in ways other than just the presence or absence of patent for a man of mm -hmm. That's true, yes. So their age may be different, their gender may be different, their economic status or education status might be different. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. Okay, and Sarah has just asked, asked a question which I believe is directed to you. She yes, says yes. you need to perform transesophageal echography to see it. Can you see those comments made? Yeah, that, that was in the past the main method, but now it now the last year it's okay if you did a contrast with the trans thoracic. Okay, so look at this stage. I and uh, Nina, you are, you are also making some comments. That's a different question, I presume. Mm -hmm. So look, I'm going to Masha. I'm just going to summarize. Uh, yes, please. I believe you will have two different groups of people who you would have identified one through presentation in hospital, other through an advertisement to invite healthy volunteers and you will perform a test on them. Is that right? Marcia? Yes, yes, that's true. And then you will follow these people up to see whether the findings of your test correlate with their future outcome. Yes, one to ten years approximately. So this is a type of a cohort study. It's not a typical cohort study. In typical cohort study, all the people included at the beginning have the same characteristics. But because you are following people up in time, your healthy controls are not defined by presence or absence of disease. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So this is a special type of a cohort study where some people can call it also a hybrid design, or there are many names can be given to it, but the main feature is you identify people, you give them an intervention, you follow them up over time to see what is their outcome. And as, as soon as you get element of follow up in a study, it becomes like a cohort study. Okay, I turn now, Nina, you have, uh, You have patients with uh, atrial fibrillation, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, and um, you have two methods of catheter ablation, and then you want to compare clinical parameters Well, that's a well-defined question. Um, I don't have any specific comment other than to say when you say you will make comparison according to clinical parameters, I think you need to define what those parameters will be. And as soon as you can define them, then you need to think about how they will be met. Okay, so now I move to Mitya. Mitya. Prognostic accuracy of different tests in detection of lung cancer. Now, tomorrow we will talk in more detail about accuracy of tests. But what you'll highlight here, prognostic accuracy, predictive model. Remember, predictive model is a statistical analytic methods. Predictive model is not an intervention. Or in this case, is it an intervention? Uh, Mitya, can you clarify that? Maybe you can unmute your mic and clarify that? Yes, I will try <laughs> uh, because I'm not sure. Um, 
how to you know how to get into uh, the strategy in the correct way uh, mm -hmm. my planned study will um, will involve lung cancer patients um, and I will try to develop a machine learning algorithm uh, to predict um, the probability that these patients will uh, will uh, indeed get uh, the lung cancer in let's say uh, a couple of years. Yeah, from uh, from the point where when this um, algorithm will be tested. Okay, just one 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 sec before you go. Uh... The people who you will test will be those with known lung cancer or will be just people with risk factors? No, it will be people with existing, it will be a retrospective study. So all the data are already existing, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, in the hospital database. Uh, I will choose um, all available lung cancer patients uh, okay. in this hospital so i i think it will be around 5000 patients with different okay. uh, tests performed yeah in the lung function tests um, uh, blood tests uh, uh, medical history and uh, some vital signs um and the con con control uh, group for uh, which is also important for the development of this machine learning algorithm will be composed of uh, healthy uh, matched controls, yeah? Uh, okay. I will so, try to look, match them in as much uh, factors as possible. Okay, so basically your outcome of the prediction hmm? using machine learning yes. will be how accurate the model was, is that correct? Yes, uh, the model we will just say, um, uh, Yes or no? It will have a binary outcome. Yeah, it will say, does this patient uh, have a probability that uh, he will develop lung cancer in the the covered time time frame? Okay, and that will be the result, main result of your thesis. Is that correct? Yes. All right. So basically, yours is a study where you will determine the accuracy of a prediction model using this control design. Uh, I'm not sure. Is this a case control design? That was... But you, look, oh. you, you decided to choose people with known diagnosis. They, this is a case, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. That's the outcome is already known in this situation. Mm -hmm. Then you decided to identify healthy controls who are your controls. Yes. You went back in time to discover information about them. Yes. So this is a classical case control design. You are going back in time to check what happened to them in the past. And your statistical analysis involves machine learning. Yes, but uh, in reality, I, I will have both. Uh, I will have information about the out, outcome, and I will also have information about their initial uh, exposure. Yeah, this exposure will will just mean uh, this in results of different investigations. But I just like you to hold on one second. Mm -hmm. The initial exposure will have been determined after the knowledge of the fact that they have lung cancer, right? Oh. Hmm. You will travel well, back really, in time after data... knowing... You will travel but... back in time after knowing who has lung cancer. Yes, but also I will have a population who has lung cancer and uh, part of population doesn't have, is healthy population, yeah? Well, this but... is a classical case control design. Okay. I just I just take you to to the slide I showed yesterday and let's see how what you propose just now is different to what I showed yesterday. Now it may be possible that your supervisor doesn't like to call this case, case control design because it does not look excuse the use of the term sexy enough, right? This is what we studied yesterday. 
you start with outcome lung cancer control mm -hmm. without lung cancer you go back in time to see what were their exposures and then you just apply machine learning over here when you have all of this information available Yes, I agree, but uh, I'm bothered with the fact that uh, I already, I also know what were the exposures. I will just... Uh, in every case control study, you know what were the exposures, because you go back in time to find them out. Mm -hmm. Because if you cannot know the exposure, you cannot apply your machine learning model. Yes. Okay, so, so it is a case control design. Okay, now this is... I'm bothered because it's not a classical clinical study. It's, it combines this uh, machine learning part, and so it's difficult for me to, uh, to interpret it. <laughs> well, if, you are, if you're asking me to comment on what you told me, mm -hmm. the machine learning part is only applied at this time when you calculate the effect size right at the bottom. Mm -hmm. The machine learning part is simply a statistical technique applied to a case control study. There is nothing special about machine learning other than the fact that it uses a computer that can keep on working all night when you and your supervisor are sleeping, and in the morning it can give you the statistical output. Mm -hmm. Or is there something more smart about it than what I said? No. It if put this way, uh, I think, yes, I think you're right. <laughs> okay. Thank you for agreeing with me. <laughs> right. <laughs> Let's uh, look. My job is to simplify things. Maybe it is too simplified. But please try to understand. Once you understand it in a simple way, you then have the possibility to add layers of complexity to the basic understanding. Mm -hmm. So please don't become confused by the fact that there is machine learning. Machine learning is simply a method of statistical analysis. There's nothing more fancy about machine learning than that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, now, I do not say that machine learning is simple. People spend their whole life learning about how machine learning works. So clearly there is more to it than what I said in a few words just now, but that does not take away the fact that it is applying this sophisticated statistical method to a classical case control design. Mm -hmm. We move on to another colleague, if I miss. Uh, Polona, you are next, is that right, in the list of topics described? Uh, um, your question is timing of What is ARM? It's anorectal malformation. All right, we talked about that yesterday yes, as well. But I changed the question a bit to make it Very a case good. control study. I think this yeah. is mm -hmm. a second. Patient, patients. Um, so patients who are operated are your patients? Yes, the patients that are operated. Exposures. The exposures are uh, uh, operated yeah, early or operated yeah. late. Yeah. And the outcome is function. Polona, am I right? Your exposures are operated early or operated late? Yes. And then your outcome is the bowel function? Yes. Well, that's a, that's a very, very clear question. The moment you know this, then you know this is, is a study that involves follow-up. There is a cohort. and. Look, when you have all this data, well, I suppose you can apply machine learning here to determine what are the predictive factors that determine outcomes in these patients. The, what the statistics you apply are up to you and your supervisor. Uh, the method of analysis of the data is not limited by the question. Thank you. Jaka, you. we move to your question. Okay, you want to make some comments about it if you're already on the on the on on the speaker. 
Um, my question is, can bile acids be used as biomarkers for hepatocellular carcinoma? Okay, well, that's, uh, so in this study, will you have, so you will also have healthy volunteers and those with carcinoma, and I presume you will go back in time to figure out whether they have uh, biomarkers present in the past, is that correct? No, the, the objective is to collect blood samples and to, to compare the bile acid profile and to try to develop uh, biomarkers for yes. uh, diagnosis. Fine. So in this Diag case, you may have collected the data on the biomarker at the same time when you determine the outcome. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. In this case, it's more like a cross-sectional study where you don't have time follow-up involved, either forward in time or backward mm -hmm. in time. So it's a cross-sectional. That's correct. And then, and then you will determine the accuracy of whether the marker has a particular sensitivity or specificity. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Okay. So this is a classical, this we call a classical test accuracy study. It is a cross-sectional study. Uh, tomorrow we will discuss this type of a design in more detail. And if you do so, so you are calling it a case control study. Case yeah, control yeah. study can be a design for a test accuracy evaluation. Uh, and uh, let's uh, discuss uh, this in more detail tomorrow. Okay. And and the same applies to uh, to uh, the question about use of machine learning. Let's discuss okay, this yeah. in more detail tomorrow. When you refer to prediction, you are normally including uh, the possibility of follow-up in time. This changes the nature of the relationship between the test and the outcome. And again, this is a feature we will study in more detail tomorrow when we look at evaluation of tests. Okay, so shall we, at this stage, I think we have covered everybody's... Uh, Katrina also has a question about uh, patients with pain. Intervention is uh, EMG. EMG, okay. Nerve, nerve studies, and the outcome is uh... well. What is the outcome? I don't understand. What is the outcome? Um, so yes, uh, hello. I, I, to explain that that be that will be nice. I see now that I forgot to mention the outcome. The outcome would be the betterment of the symptoms. So, um, um, I would design this study for three cohorts like one would be just emg test one would be skin biopsy and one would be uh with patients who had bo both done so uh, we would compare uh which uh, therapies they received and how much um their symptoms uh got better so how how um how much how much less pain or paresthesia they are um experiencing in the end that would be the outcome so perhaps you are trying to figure out if the knowledge of test helps the clinician give a better treatment is that correct yes my main question would be is the skin biopsy needed at all for um diagnosing and treating the neuropathies or when is it needed like um, in some special cases or uh, in all of the patients who have positive uh, symptoms? Okay, so I think... Uh, I think it, could, could everybody check that their microphones are muted? Uh, so... I don't need him. Yeah. Mm. 
Okay. So look, your design is a cohort design because you are following people up in time forward. Okay. Uh, depending on your question, what kind of analysis you construct to determine the effect size mm -hmm. or determine the result of your question, of your analysis, will, will possibly be uh, influenced by exactly what is it that you wish to discover. So with this, with this, I would like to move on next to what I had to present. Um, what I would like to do is at the next step is talk a little bit about how the analysis is constructed. So it's important to understand construction of the analysis in order to understand how to extract the data from a paper in a systematic review. So let me just see, let me just summarize where we are before I get to that step. So maybe this is revision, but I believe this is important revision. So you can see here that uh, the steps are frame the question, search the literature, when the papers are identified, extract the data. In order to understand what data need to be extracted, we need to understand how analysis should be constructed to address our question. So first, let's look at a very simple analysis. We are now, in order to understand this, we are now talking about a randomized trial. We'll show you an example of that trial in just one second. But I'm presenting you a measure of effect called odds ratio. The odds ratio is an estimate measured by this blob in green color. And then whatever we measure has an uncertainty in the measurement and that is represented by this line and we call it confidence interval. And we can use this type of a diagram called forest plot. Um, the value one represents that the likelihood or the odds of the outcome are no different between control group and intervention group. But if this blob and confidence interval is a lot on this side, we say that the odds of the outcome are increased in the intervention group. If this blob and the confidence interval are a lot on say that they are increased in the control group. And we are talking about an outcome that is bad, for example, death or poor quality of life or some kind of morbidity. Uh, if the outcome is positive, for example, becoming pregnant, then the direction could be in the opposite way that I just described. So for an outcome that is negative like death, a value less than one of odds ratio will represent a benefit in favor of intervention. So in this type of situation, we will say this study shows that the intervention is effective. And we will say this intervention is so effective that the confidence interval does not cross the value one. So we are certain that this study shows that this intervention is effective beyond the play of chance. In other words, this result is also statistically significant. And in another situation, we will say, well, this intervention is harmful, the placebo is better, it actually kills more people if the outcome is mortality, because the odds ratio and all of the confidence interval is on this side of the line one. 
Does this make sense? Uh, I'm very happy to clarify any uncertainty about this idea that I've just described. I'm just going to bring the chat back on so I can see what your comments are. Um, I would like to ask if I can. Yes. Yes, in please. this type of um, of a plot of forest plot, is the event always negative, or or we can have also forest plot inverted when we are looking to a positive event? For example, uh, um, I don't know clearance of a virus from our system or something like that would be a positive event. So the plot would be. Um, directed in the opposite direction, right? That's correct. So I take another example, which to me is a very, very clear example of a positive event, which is becoming for example, pregnant yes, uh, for an getting... infertile patient or being alive for a patient with cancer after many years. But sadly, our research is constructed by people before us in such a way that they always tend to convert this type of positive event on its head and say that we don't want to measure number of people who are alive. We want to measure number of people who are dead. Uh, so most of the time, this type of a plot is presented in the way I have presented it here. But you are quite right. If we turn the outcome on its head and say clearance of virus or presence of pregnancy or presence of being alive, not dead, then we can just turn this around from being favors intervention onto this side and controls and favors control to this side. It's entirely in your own hands as a researcher to determine how you construct this type of graph. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes, of course. Thank you. Okay. So for the purpose of my presentation in this graph, the outcome is a negative event like death or perinatal mortality or absence of survival in a cohort of people with cancer. And then, Mirella, your question is, is this horizontal line? You mean by horizontal, you mean this line? No, uh, where you have uh, those circles, okay? Like, um, uh, I'm uh, just thinking the length of, uh, because we find it uh, usually in investigations. Yes, this line, yeah. You see, the, yes, the, uh, you have three horizontal lines, okay, on your uh, yeah, you mean this line. ratios. Yes. This, this, this line, yes. okay. The this, this line across the blob. Yes. Okay, so this line measures the confidence interval. It is called the confidence interval. Guess what? How long is this line depends almost entirely on the sample size. If you study 10,000 patients and the outcome is reasonably common, then this line could be so small that it could be entirely inside this blob. It could be just so small that it's just there. If you only study 10 patients, the line could be so long that it may not even fit inside this slide. So what I want you to think about this line is that this line is simply a function of the sample size. This is a very, very simple way of describing it. There is more to say about this, which we'll talk later on than sample size alone. But sample size is one of the key determinant in most studies of the length of this line. Make sense? Yeah. Much. Thank you. All right. So I now give you a question. 
you can see that the length of this line is roughly the same as the length of this line, right? But the results are in the opposite direction. This one shows that treatment is better. It is very likely that these two studies have roughly the same sample size. What about this study? The length of the line is smaller in this study than the length of the line in this or that study. Is that correct? You can see that. And the size of the blob I have drawn is bigger than this blob or this blob. So frequently when we draw this type of a diagram in a meta-analysis, we try to capture the size of the study by the length of this line and the size of this blob. So now you have studied several features of this type of a diagram. One of the features is that depending on how you define the outcome, where this blob and line is can tell you whether the intervention is effective or not. And secondly, you can have a good idea about the size of the study or the relative size of the study amongst the studies included in this type of a diagram. Okay, keep this idea in your head. Now we would like, I would like to move on to how we calculate odds ratio and what are odds. In order to do this, I'll move on to a diagram like this. And please remind me to come back to the previous diagram in, in a second. So whenever you are extracting data for any type of systematic review, you should try to understand for your question, what type of analyses are possible? And then from that, you can figure out what type of data you will need to extract papers. So we've talked about the fact that in any study, there is a typical flow from participants to interventions to outcomes. And then in this case, you will use all of the data collected to calculate the effect size. So if in a study there are 200 people, they are being followed up, 100 in each group. In order to simplify for the purpose of today's topic, which is randomized trials, let's say that the intervention has been randomly allocated to these 200 people, so about 100 people are in each group you will know that in real life, it would be very hard to do a study without any patient or data loss. So when you construct your data extraction strategy, think about collecting data concerning at what stage, how many patients were lost. Could be that patients were lost before randomization lost after randomization, could be that the patients were lost after the intervention and the control were allocated. Could also be that the data were lost after uh, the data about outcome had been collected because something went wrong in your data collection system. And with all of this information, you are then also able to calculate the effect size. So we're going to take a hypothetical study where a group of 200 infertile couples in a hypothetical study where there are no data losses were followed up and under intervention, 25 became pregnant and under control, 10 became pregnant. 
And from this data, we will calculate in a very simple way the effect size. So the first thing for construction of an effect size is the construction of what we call a two by two table. The table on the top has outcomes and on the side has intervention or control. So now can you see that construction of your research question is really critical? If you do not know what is the outcome and what is the intervention and control, you may construct the two by two table in the wrong way around. Can you see that? If you end up putting intervention here and control here and outcome present and outcome absent over here, maybe you will not get the right statistical calculation. The people who became pregnant in the intervention group need to be put over there. The total need to go over here. And those who became pregnant need to go over there and the control over there. So can you now begin to see the relationship between the construction of your research question, the importance of it to the construction of the two by two table, and then putting the information concerning outcome intervention or exposure present or ex exposure absent in the correct order. And then you have some likelihood of constructing your analysis correctly. Here we have the table from this hypothetical study we are talking about. You can also see that when we talk about participants, this information is contained over here. The total of the two group presented somewhere around here as 200 is your participants. So, we talked earlier about odds ratio, but you also are familiar with a term called relative risk. We'll calculate the relative risk first because it's simpler to understand. The risk is a proportion. So what is the risk of becoming pregnant or the chance of becoming pregnant in the intervention group? Well, it's 25 divided by 100, which is 0 0.25. The chance of becoming pregnant in the control group is 10 divided by 100, which is 0.1. And the relative risk is one divided by the other. And then we get that over here and it's 2.5. Odds ratio, it is not risk or chance or probability or proportion. It's odds that is important in the calculation of odds ratio. So what is odds? For the calculation of odds, we need a different piece of information, which is over here. We divide the number of people pregnant divided by the number of people who are not pregnant in the intervention group. And the odds of the control is the number of people in the control group who become pregnant divided by the number who did not become pregnant in the control group. You can see what the odds are, and when you divide one by the other, you get odds ratio. And you get three. You can also see here that the value three is a number greater than the value 2.5. So you can see that depending on the analysis you apply, given the same data set, you can get different results or different effect sizes. Okay, I'm going to stop here and let you ask me any questions concerning construction of effect size.
based on the two example I've given you. How do you define effect size? That's a good question. So I've given you examples of two effect sizes. One is called relative risk, and the other one is called odds ratio. Okay, uh, so relative risk and odds ratio are two uh, examples of effect size. And the value of the result is the size the name of the measure is the effect. Okay. Yeah, so the effect size using the effect measure relative risk is 2.5. The effect size using the effect measure odds ratio is 3.0. Okay, thank you. The effect measure odds ratio is calculated by using the odds per group. The effect measure relative risk is calculated by using the measure of risk per group. Very happy for you to, I, I know that I have covered a lot very quickly. So I'd just like you to take your time to think through what we have been through. Because once you can understand what we have been through, it will become very easy for you to extract data for your systematic reviews. May I ask something? Of course, please go ahead. Um... If uh, we are we are doing a systematic review, yeah, and we find uh, several uh, literature articles uh, with uh, similar, but uh, at the same time also different outcomes. Uh, for example, uh, a couple of articles uh, uh, defines outcomes with uh, relative risk. Uh, another set of articles defines odds odds ratio. And let's say we also have some articles with hazard ratio. Uh, mm -hmm. And if uh, in the systematic review, uh, we would like to, uh, of course, cover all of uh, existing uh, literature data. Yeah. Is there any way that we could uh, join uh, all of these outcomes in, uh, under the same meta analysis? Yes, okay. So that's a good point. So the first thing to remember is that when you are going to be a systematic reviewer, you are not a slave of the author who wrote the original paper that you have selected for your review. You are an independent researcher who has his own independent mind and his own independent way of thinking about his or her research question. So it does not matter what the original author reported, whether they reported relative risk or odds ratio or hazard ratio or mean difference or something else. As, as you can by reading the tables and the data provided, construct the two by two table mm -hmm. for the purpose of your own systematic review, you can perform your own analysis. Mm -hmm. So we can recalculate uh, whatever we want as long as we have available data. Yeah. That is the whole idea behind being an independent systematic reviewer 
with your own mind. Mm -hmm. Look, okay. this is very, very important to understand. Mm -hmm. Authors make mistakes, editors make mistakes, peer reviewers make mistakes. Almost all the papers that you will ever read in your life will have mistakes in them and they will not have been constructed or analyzed in a way that you feel is the right way for your analysis and approach to a research question. So mm -hmm. when you are a systematic reviewer, you are an independent researcher. Okay, so you I will be saying, able to... You mm -hmm. are not chained to the story of what was published in a few years ago in a different journal. Okay, I understand. Thank you. So I would be able uh, to use all articles which uh, enable me uh, to obtain the figures that I'm interested in. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. thanks. If you cannot obtain those figures that you need, you can just write an email to the author and ask them to respond. If they don't respond, you can write them a second email. If they don't respond, at the time when you submit your manuscript of the systematic review for publication, you can state in your methods and results that you approached the author for data and they were unable to respond. So you were, as a result, able to or not able to perform the analysis that you wanted. Okay, I think some while I was addressing this point, some some comments may have appeared in ah, there, there, there. There isn't any more comment so far. Very happy to take more comment or question, please. Uh, feel free even to ask about how we got here. I think someone attempted to unmute their mic. I'm, I'm patient and happy to take any more questions at this stage. Okay, look, we have uh, about 45 minutes left in today's time of work available to us. I'm going to briefly now take you to the next stage in data extraction. But before that, I'd like to cover one element really important concerning literature search. So for the purpose of orientation, I'd just like to remind you one more time where we are. And I'd like to take you back to this slide that we have seen before. So you have framed a question. You have searched the literature. You have identified the studies. And you have now also extracted some data from them. From this data, you are able to calculate the effect size for the studies that you have collected. I think yesterday colleagues asked me whether there is a risk that we need to search that some some colleagues pointed out that it was a lot of effort to search many different databases. And I said, yes, it is a lot of effort. And then I think nobody said, but I point out to you that there is also a risk that there may have been studies conducted that we cannot capture in our search. So it's an important question for any systematic reviewer to worry about. In my systematic review, will I have any missing studies? So one of the ways to avoid missing studies is to search as many databases as you can. 
But another way to try to figure out if you have any missing studies is to examine the data you have extracted in order to see whether there is a risk of missing studies. So we now want to look at how this can be achieved. So assessing the risk of missing studies is also called something like examining the risk of publication bias. This type of a bias usually arises due to small study effects. It arises when publications of studies are linked to the significance of their findings regardless of the quality of the study. So I'm going to ask you a simple question. In the slide I showed you a moment ago. In these two studies, which study is more likely to be missed? The bad one, the negative one. This one. The one on the right hand side. OK, that's a good point. Alex says, yes, the one on the right hand side. OK, if the right hand side study was missing. Do you think there could be a problem in our systematic review? Yeah, Jacka is correct. The one missing control is more missing. Yes, we could have a big problem in that we may, by mistake, begin to conclude that this intervention is effective because we could not capture this study. So it is very important to try to figure out that we have not missing studies. So the way to do that is to calculate these effect sizes that we talked about and then to think about whether there is a relationship between effect size relationship between the effect size and the size of the study. Remember, I mentioned to you that the length of the confidence interval is related to the size of the study. And typically, we say that when the study is too small, it can have type 2 error. Type 2 error is the chance of not having a significant finding when the study is small. So in a typical meta-analysis, there does not have missing studies. The small studies will be spread all over the place because by chance they could have a large effect size or by chance they could have a small effect size compared to the large good quality studies in this matter in, in 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 the same topic and this type of a distribution of studies inside a meta analysis is called a plot a, a funnel plot and the funnel is said to be symmetrical but you can also have studies where small studies in one side of the plot are missing this type of a plot is called an asymmetrical funnel plot. And this type of a plot arises because the journals are more interested in publishing a particular type of result on a particular topic. So in this case, the studies on this side of the of the funnel plot appear to be missing inside this funnel. Can you see that clearly? Does anybody have any comment to make on what I've just shown? Okay, Jaka says it's clear, thank you. Other people haven't said anything, but, but perhaps, okay, 
To Polona, it's also clear. Catherine, also clear. Thank you. Well, these are the missing studies. And the, actually, now I give you a big secret. Well, it should no longer be a secret to you. This idea that small studies by chance have type 2 error and cannot produce significant results is only imagined by people who have written textbooks without engaging in research themselves. Because you can see that because publication bias exists, there is a good chance that small studies will exist in the literature that will more likely, because of cherry picking of results and using unrepresentative sample, will give extreme results. And as a result of the extreme results, this frequently stated textbook statement that small sample sizes lead to type 2 error will in fact prove wrong in real research practice. Give you an example. This is a, a published study concerning infertility. It concludes that anti-estrogen therapy improves pregnancy rates. This is the published meta-analysis. This is the funnel plot of the data. And even though the data shows even to a blind person that there are missing studies, no comment is made in this meta-analysis concerning missing studies. If you have attended this course, you will be able to see that you will not agree with the conclusion reported in this published systematic review. Any, 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 anybody wishes to make any comment on what I just said? Well, there are no comments, but I hope you will, through this process, start to begin to be confident that when you read papers, you don't just accept what is published in the abstract or what's published in the conclusions in the discussion. You will be able to make your own interpretation of what you observe. And this is what systematic review and becoming a systematic reviewer is about. You can generate your own opinion about data pre-published based on a proper evaluation of what you read in the published paper. So this is taking you to the next step in data extraction. We're now going to move on to what is the best way to do data extraction? Well, you should do it in duplicate. You should use some statistic to see if two people extract the data from a paper, you come up with the same result. And then you can also report the characteristics of the studies in a study characteristics tables. But then you need to report the quality of the study. So here I like to remind you that there are in of all different kinds in published papers. As a systematic reviewer, your role is to pick up those errors and yesterday, somebody said to me, can I comment about study designs? And here I'm going to make some comments about study designs in the context of study quality. So study quality is the Achilles heel of good research. The study quality refers to the validity or freeness from bias of a published study. The typical idea is that a randomized trial is less subject to bias than cohort study, and it's less subject to bias than a case control study. Uh, I'd like to highlight very much here to the colleague who is going to use machine learning, that machine learning does not make your data or study free of bias. The method you employ to collect the data is what makes your study free of bias. 
So if your data are if the source of your data are a case control design, no matter how fancy your machine learning model will be, the underlying sources of bias cannot be eliminated from this type of a design by using fancy statistics. The power. Now I'm not talking about statistical power. I'm talking about the power of trustworthiness of a study lies in the method or design employed for collecting data. And in the context of effectiveness research, randomized trial is uh, considered more trustworthy than the cohort study. And a cohort study is considered more trustworthy than a case control study. Collecting the data concerning quality in data extraction in a systematic reviews will allow you to use this information to include this inside tables, inside figures, but also to more analytically employ uh, your assessment of the data uh, in order to make more robust inferences, which you can then no, include in your discussion section. So we return back to this uh, hierarchy of designs. I'm going, I'm going to just pause here for a moment and see if colleagues have any questions concerning study design for me. Okay, well, I, I hope I have encouraged you to think, even if I haven't managed to encourage you to ask me any questions. Uh, I remind you again of uh, some things I said yesterday um, about basic laboratory research being applied research and patient-centered research uh, being, uh, sorry, uh, basic laboratory research being uh, research concerning uh, development of scientific knowledge and the research from patients, the data collected from patients uh, being research that is applied research. So you can see that Basic laboratory research can or lab, cannot directly be applied to patients, and that is the reason why it normally ranks lower down in this hierarchy of evidence. Okay, we now come to randomized control trial and how you can assess whether a randomized control trial is a good quality trial. So when you conduct a randomized trial, we have same idea. Sample allocated to two groups by randomization. Following randomization, people are followed up to see whether they have outcome or not. And when we have these data available, we can calculate the effect size. And you will know from what I said before that if the sample size is quite large, the confidence interval of the effect size could be quite narrow. So we, we immediately can solve the problem of confidence interval by recruiting a lot of patients. But whether this effect size will be trustworthy depends on other features. Those features are, well, one of those features is whether the sample size is representative. This, this specific aspect refers to something called generalizability, 
we will not be talking about this today. We'll talk about this another day. So uh, I flag this up for you, but then I take this away from consideration. We now return to the idea of bias or internal validity or, or something that I call quality. And we refer to these things called selection bias, performance bias, and measurement bias. And a randomized trial can have selection bias because randomization has not been conducted properly. It can have performance bias because blinding has not been conducted properly. It can have measurement bias because outcome measurement has not been blinded properly. And it can also have something called attrition bias because follow-up of patients has not been complete. So you can see that a randomized trial needs to have all of these things done right in order for it to be free of bias. So if it is not free of bias with respect to blinding during the course of the study, then in the example of acupuncture studies, an empirical evaluation shows that in non-blinded randomized trial, the effect looks far better than the control compared to blinded trials where the effect looks much closer to control. Okay, so blinding in randomization is important because it creates groups balanced at baseline. A cohort study normally suffers in this area of selection bias. In terms of blinding related to follow-up after randomization, here the groups are balanced in respect to co-intervention after randomization. This is called performance bias. And we already referred to measurement of outcome. For example, even if a patient is even if the outcome is something like death, there could be bias in its measurement if the patient is on a ventilator, because the criteria for how we define death for a ventilated patient could vary from one intensive care specialist to another intensive care specialist. And then attrition why we already looked at it earlier when we talked about how we calculate effect size, and I said it was very important to determine whether they were missing patients or missing data. So the quality of a randomized trial can be assessed in this way, looking at selection bias, by presence or absence of double blinding, by looking at performance bias and measurement bias, by looking at attrition bias, by examining whether people dropped out or didn't. And when we have this information available, we can say whether a study included in a systematic review is of high or low quality. So can you see now how important it is to report the quality of studies, including in your systematic review, even when they are randomized control trials? Because within randomized control trials, there is a possibility of high or low quality trials, depending on whether or not they have attrition bias or measurement bias or performance bias or risk of selection bias due to flaws in methods used for randomization. So the consort statement, remember we talked yesterday about PRISMA statement required for reporting systematic reviews for randomized trials. 
the statement required for reporting is called consort and consort requires you to report inside a published trial features concerning outcomes and allocation of randomized allocation method for randomization etc so in a properly reported trial you should be able to capture this information and create this type of a table i just noticed a question in the chat which says what was the plus and minus in column 4 okay so in a scoring system for quality assessment called hadad scoring system you can allocate a score of plus 1 or 0 or minus 1 to a trial according to whether or not it properly randomized or had double blinding or had completeness of follow up and with this type of a score you can achieve a score from 0 to 5 so this study that has scored a maximum of 5 we call it a high quality study but any score up to three is called a low quality study. I hope that answer your question. And there are other methods of quality assessment available. When you plan your systematic review, you can decide which type of quality assessment method you will apply in your systematic review. Okay, so to summarize, we just we just go back for a moment to a randomized trial. We said a moment ago that if you conduct a randomized trial, you are expected to report the randomized trial according to consort, which allows for systematic reviewers to capture information concerning biasing factors as to how randomization was implemented, how blinding was implemented, and how outcome measures were uh, implemented. But if you are using, if you are conducting a randomized trial, just like I said yesterday, that systematic reviews should be prospectively registered, randomized trials are also expected to be prospectively registered. And uh, a prospective registration site would require you to register a trial and using your protocol you can publish your trial and the guideline or reporting method for writing up the manuscript of a randomized trial is, is called a spirit guideline so if you're doing a systematic review of a randomized trial not only the published trial is a source of information for assessment of quality of a trial but also its prospective registration document is source of information and its published protocol if the protocol has been published so you have three or four sources of information from which to extract data concerning a trial included in your systematic review In the meantime, I noticed a question coming up. Before ending the lecture, can I show you again the flowchart concerning levels of evidence? Of course. In fact, I'm going to show you that just now. It's a good, it's, it's, it's a time to ask that, it's a right time to ask that question. Go back to that flowchart. Here it is. We talked in more detail in the last 15 minutes about randomized control trials. The randomized control trials themselves can be high or low quality. And low quality randomized trials could be 
very close to observational studies in terms of trustworthiness. And observational studies of high quality can be very close to randomized trials in terms of trustworthiness. I believe this lecture is being recorded, so I believe the recording will be available to you. And I will be very happy to share a PDF file of all my slides without any problems. And for colleagues who asked me yesterday about my systematic review book, everything I said today about quality assessment concerning the details of assessment of a randomized trial are all available within that systematic review. And in addition, there are several examples included in the book that explain also how to measure quality of observational studies, including observational studies of cohort design and case control design. So Sarah, you asked about uh, whether I can show you the flow chart for assessing levels of evidence. I would be grateful if you could let me know whether you have any questions. Uh, yeah. No, yeah. We, thank you. It's okay. Just wanted to review it because I think it's a very useful uh, flow chart. Well, look, I'm going to say also to you that this flow chart is not set in stone. You can feel free to construct your own versions of this in line with, uh, with, with better, greater understanding of how quality is assessed. For example, you can see that 2B has put together low quality RCTs with um, cohort studies of higher quality. You can probably also notice from this flowchart that when I said to you yesterday, a randomized trial is a type of a cohort study, that, sh that you can make the link between that concept from the slide yesterday and this chart. And what is an ecological study? Uh, an ecological study is a study where the outcomes and exposures are not measured in the same patients. So, for example, um, ecological exposure could be the pollution levels in a city measured by pollution measures devices placed by the environmental agency of the city. And the outcomes could be the level of malformations amongst pregnancies in that city. So you can see that the outcome malformations is measured in pregnant women, but their exposure to pollution was not measured directly by taking their blood samples. Can you see what I mean now? Yeah, the so it's, of exposure it's a... was separated from the source of measurement of outcome. Okay, so it's a kind of observation, observational study. That's correct. It's a type of observational study. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I think at this stage, I'd like to uh, summarize where we stand. Uh, tomorrow, we'll have a chance to talk more about diagnostic research and grading of evidence, and perhaps also some better interpretation of findings of uh, studies of different kinds. So let's see where we are at the moment.
we've talked about how questions can be framed. We've talked about how literature searches can be constructed from the question. We have talked about how from the question we can determine what kind of data we need to extract, both concerning the numbers of patients in different exposure groups with different outcomes, but also concerning the quality of the study according to our research question and its design and important quality features of the design. And then with all of these data extracted, we are able to construct tables that describe the studies, that describe the features of the studies, that describe the quality of the studies, that even describe the results of the studies. And we can even construct figures from these data. So tomorrow we will talk about study synthesis using these extracted data. And in the process of discovering what is necessary for data extraction, I have given you details of how to extract, construct data extraction ideas uh, using example of a randomized control trial. So from what I have described, you should also be able to imagine for yourself how a randomized trial could be planned and executed. Uh, because if you can plan and execute a randomized control trial, you would also know how to extract data from a randomized control trial. So I'm going to stop here and leave the last 15 minutes for comments, questions. Any need for me to go over anything I have presented today and yesterday to clarify any, any, any points that need clarification. Well, I am waiting and you have time to think about what I have said. Uh, I am very happy for you to think about your own question and how if you were constructing a systematic review in your topic, how would you extract it? Uh, think about that and ask me questions about the while you think about that why don't i make myself very quickly a cup of tea please stay and i'll be back in about 90 seconds that's all it will take me to make myself a cup of tea
All right, I'm back. Uh, let's see if there are any comments made. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. How long does but the contract system 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 system. How long does systematic yeah, review usually system. take? That's a, uh, that's a question by Marija. Maria, the, it depends almost entirely so on how many studies there, there, there are in a systematic review. Is this commentary directed to me? Can somebody explain what is being uh -huh. said? Gaber was speaking. Gaber, can you? Ah, you're just laughing because you're listening to what he said. All right. Well, I hope whatever has been said is not impolite. Uh, okay. Well, Maria, your question, it depends entirely on uh, the topic. I have been in systematic reviews that have been completed and submitted within three months. Uh, but no, no, no problem. No problem. No problem. No problem. I, I don't have any problem. And uh, that, that the microphone wasn't switched off, uh, but but, but uh, I have also been involved in systematic review projects that have, that have taken two or three years. Now you probably also know that the process of getting from submitted to publication can take several months. So if you're looking at from the time of designing your question to getting published this could be definitely longer than two or three months but completing a review can happen within two or three months and any more Questions or uh, comments? May, may I ask you, how many of you expect to write a background chapter for your thesis that Up until now, you hadn't thought about writing it based on a systematic review. Would you like to make a comment about that? Everyone's quiet. Well, yes, definitely. That's why I am. I mentioned this point yesterday, but I think I want to emphasize this again today. Your background chapter, my experiences, takes a lot of effort to write. But why not include within the background chapter a systematic review and submit it as a publication? the effort you make will be converted into a paper and you will have an additional paper. It will even be published before you go for your VIVA exam for the thesis. So you will enter your VIVA examination with confidence that you already have a paper published on the topic that you are studying. Polona, what do you think? 
Well, uh, it's a, of course a good proposition, but uh, the time that we have, like uh, a month or two, to prepare the systematic review uh, on a topic, uh, I think it's you know to make a scheme or something, but not to make a proper systematic review. Or why wouldn't you want to make a proper systematic review? If my time is limited. Let me put to you. If your time is limited and you do something haphazard, I mean that's not going to be that's not going to give you any advantage. When the time is limited, is it is even more important to be systematic. The only person who can afford to be haphazard is the one who has lots of time. People who don't have time need to be extremely systematic. Agree. The pe only people who can afford to waste money are the ones who have a lot of money. People who don't have money have to be extremely careful about how they use their limited amount of money. The same applies to people who have limited time. Um, um, Marika, what is your um, comment? Uh, Maria, you're wanting to say something. Tell me. I'm sorry, it's still me, Polona. Ah, Polona, go ahead. Uh, and uh, if we find out that there is no systematic review on the topic that we are researching, then this is our first systematic review. Well, that then it will have an even more fantastic chance of getting public in a in a journal. Yay! And okay. let's say, if you do a review and you find very few studies, then describe your methods of searching and the uh, and, and whatever you found with table one and the appendix that I described. And all of that can be described in your background chapter, and this will make a fantastic background for the justification of your thesis work. Okay. Well, when you say, uh, Maria, you say we can publish it later. What do you mean by later? You mean after your viva? Maria? Well, Ma Maria hasn't come back. So uh, Maria's question appears to be, if you do a systematic review, an exercise for my thesis, I can publish it later. Of course, you can publish it. But later is not the right word. You need to publish it immediately. You should have your systematic review published before you enter the room to give your Viva presentation. Uh, a, 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 any other colleague who has comment or question? I also wonder if Matej is back on the... Yeah. Matej, are you back? Jaka, what, what does that mean, Jay? Jaka, you said something? Ah, okay. <laughs> All right, no problem. All right. So let me just give you, uh, we need to write a systematic review. So you are, Jaka, are you saying that you are, you are convinced that that's a good idea? Would you like to unmute your mic and say something? Okay, so no problem. 
Right. So I'll just give you a brief uh, comment concerning tomorrow. Uh, Tiva, you have a question. What if published study doesn't contain enough information to determine bias? Should we exclude their study from our review? Right. Uh, that's a good point. Um, Jack also makes a comment that it's a daunting task to think about doing a systematic review. Jack, you are going to be making a big effort to write that background chapter. That background chapter will become so much easier to write if you have done a systematic review to prepare yourself for that chapter. It may look daunting, but it is just those few steps that I described to you in the last four hours. It's nothing more than that. And the question from Tiva about whether if the study is too biased, can I throw it out? Well, it depends on the circumstances. I generally prefer that it is better to describe the weaknesses of the study, including the fact that it does not have enough information to determine its weaknesses, than to just throw it out. So I guess my answer is, depending on the circumstances, it would be preferable to include such a study and report that it does not provide information to determine bias. Okay, thank you for your question, Tiva. Right, so the plan for tomorrow would be, we will look at how statistical synthesis or synthesis can be carried out using the data. And I would also like to spend a little bit of time about diagnostic research. I noticed men, at least a couple of your topics described today were diagnostic or prognostic in nature. So what we discuss tomorrow concerning diagnostic research to those colleagues whose thesis topics are concerning diagnosis. I may also mention a few words about how to evaluate quality of diagnostic studies. So hopefully that will also be useful to write the background chapter of those theses that include evaluation of or development of diagnostic tests. So with this, I bring <clears throat> today's session to close. Uh, unless there is any last minute comments, um, we, we come to the end and uh, we will see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.